Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is George. I'm a PhD student at the University of Strasbourg in France, and I'm also a senior software engineer at Atlassian in Emil Evov's team. I mostly focus on the GT Video Bridge and its congestion control and activity features. And um, I'm here today to present you some of the ways and the techniques that we use in order to reduce our overall infrastructure costs and maximize the quality of the calls that take place on our service. But before we dive into the details, I would like to say a few words about our project and how uh, and our service and how we build it. The service runs on the JIT stack, which is open source, so we will see that uh, briefly. And, and then I will show you how we build our infrastructure and then uh, some representative metrics of our service. So let's start. Here's the 10,000 foot view. The main components of the JIT stack are the signaling node, the selective forwarding unit, uh, RSFU in short, or GT Video Bridge, or simply Bridge. I'm going to use all these terms interchangeably during this presentation. Uh, we, are, we also have two client applications, one that runs on the web and one that runs on mobile devices. Uh, the web client is based on the WebRTC JavaScript APIs. These APIs were covered uh, on Monday in Bernard Boba's WebRTC tutorial. And the mobile client is based on React Native WebRTC and it's written in React Native, of course. Uh, for the signaling path, we use XMPP provided by Prosody, which is a flexible XMPP server written in Lua. And for the media path, we use UDP, DTLS, SRTP, and in case all that fails, TCP, as it is mandated by the WebRTC standard. Most of our backend is written in Java, uh, except for some parts that are written in C and C++. Uh, for example, we use the native SCTP library for SCTP support, and for which we have uh, JNI bindings. Uh, this is what Jitsi Meet looks like. This is a screenshot of uh, one of our daily stand-ups. Here we see Jan on stage. Pavel, Boris, Christo, and other members of the team are displayed in the horizontal thumbnails bar. Jitsi Meet supports multiple layouts. Uh, we have uh, a vertical thumbnails bar and a more recent Brady Bunch style layout. Depending on the layout and, of course, the available bandwidth, our SFU forwards the appropriate stream for each participant. In this specific example, Yana is being received in 720p at 30 FIPS resolution, whereas everybody else is received in 180p at 7.5 FIPS. And we also have uh, an avatar, avatar of a participant who doesn't share his or uh, her video. Um, GTMIT has many more features such as speaker stats, video quality sliders, integrated chat, Dropbox integration, transcriptions, um, etc that you are welcome to discover by browsing through our website or even better by using our service. We're not gonna cover any of that here um, uh, as it's out of scope for this, um, uh, for this presentation. The part that is not open source is how we build and scale our infrastructure. We build on the AWS cloud and we scale horizontally through sharding. A shard contains everything that's needed to host several conferences it contains all the signaling components and at least two SFUs. We auto-scale the SFUs if a shard happens to have a lot of traffic. We deploy on several AWS regions, um, North Virginia, Oregon, Ireland, Frankfurt, and Australia. Uh, I think I'm, I'm missing one Asia Pacific uh, region, but uh, yeah, you get the idea. The signaling components are a single point of failure for a shard, uh, but each region has several shards. So we, we have it covered. Other than the shards, uh, each region has an auto-scaling group of turn servers in case Direct Connect fails. Our SFUs and our turn servers run on dedicated C4X larges, which have four vCPUs, eight gigabytes of RAM, and high network performance. Our service has been steadily growing. We have doubled in traffic since last year, so that's exciting. Uh, so here's a few numbers about our service. Uh, for this past month in September, we, we did a little more than 91,000 conferences or about 3,000 calls per day on average. Uh, this is a bit more during the week, a bit less uh, during the weekend. The average duration of a call on our platform is about 38 minutes and the average size of a, size of a call uh, is 3 to 4, well, 3.3 participants. In total, we did almost 3.5 million conferencing minutes uh, or 7.25 million uh, participant minutes. 
the average RTT on our service is just slightly below uh, 300 milliseconds. Uh, so costs translate directly into infrastructure resource requirements. You pay for transfer data and virtual machine instance operational costs. So the more data you move and the more powerful virtual machine instances you need, the heftier the bill that you have to pay by the end of the month will be. So when we talk about optimizing infrastructure costs, we are really talking about minimizing data transfer and virtual machine operational costs. For call quality, there are certain constraints that need to be respected. Uh, you want to ensure smooth media playback, so you need a good congestion, congestion control algorithm that pr produces an accurate bandwidth estimate uh, that's close to the actual link capacity. But net network capacity is not the only concern. Uh, as more and more mobile devices are being used for video calls, you also need to take battery life and CPU usage into consideration. Otherwise, you risk draining the battery too, either too fast or delivering choppy playback as a result of overloading the CPU because the dec decoder will choke and start dropping frames. So a lot of your available options depend on your core architecture for group calls. When it comes to that, video service providers have two main options, multipoint control units or MCUs, or selective forwarding units or SFU, SFUs in short. MCUs take all incoming streams and transcode it into a video, single video stream and send that towards a specific receiver. This is costly and it doesn't scale well, but sometimes you just have to do it, for example, in order to support legacy devices. But if you're building today for the future, you would want to avoid using an MCU because it's not really scalable. What you would want to use is a selective forwarding unit, such as the GT Video Bridge, and the main idea is to do media packet routing instead of transcoding. It turns out it's not as simple as an IP router, and I will show you exactly how we do it, but it's pretty lightweight, especially when compared to transcoding. Uh, the best, the best uh, example to uh, display to show what an SFU does is through simulcast. Simulcast is a hot topic in the WebRTC community today. There are people both in the W3C and in the ITF that are working on standardizing the APIs to control and configure it. Today it's sort of hard coding, hard hard coded in the WebRTC engine. So it's great that we have it, but the set of things that you can do uh, are sort of predefined. Simulcast is supported in VP8 and more recently in H.264. Uh, and um, but in our case we use VP8 for everything. Uh, the main idea behind Simulcast is for an endpoint that's sending a stream to encode and send that stream in multiple resolutions. So. Then the SFU, based on the specific layout on a specific receiver, it can decide which stream to forward to that specific receiver. And this is exactly what we see in this drawing. We have three participants uh, that are sending three qualities, 720p, 360p, and 180p. And the receiver is getting 720p stream uh, for the on-stage participant and two 180p streams for the thumbnails. This is uh, what happens with uh, WebRTC simulcast. Uh, the resolutions are, are taken from that. Simulcast alone, without actually implementing any congestion control in the bridge, has a very big impact on both the infrastructure data transfer and on the user experience. In our specific case, without simulcast, endpoints are receiving 2.5 megabits per second per participant, whereas with simulcast, endpoints are receiving 2.5 megabits per second just for the on-stage participant and 150 kilobits per second for the participants that are in the thumbnails. Here in this uh, graph, we see that the amount of data that a specific participant receives as the number of participants in the call grows. So that amount of data grows linearly, but when simulcast is enabled, uh, the growth rate is much smaller and it depends on the lowest quality resolution video stream. Here in this graph, we see the egress bitrate uh, of the bridge for a single conference as the number of participants grows. It's quadratic in the number of participants. However, when simulcast is enabled, the growth rate again depends only on the low quality resolution uh, bitrate and it's much smaller. So for a 10-way call, uh, you would need 225 megabits per second without simulcast and 35 megabits per second with simulcast, which is, the difference is substantial. With VP8 simulcast, we also get temporal scalability as well. So in total, participants send nine different qualities that the bridge can choose from 
when it computes uh, the specific configuration, stream configuration, to send towards a specific, a specific receiver. So we have 720p at 30 FIPS, 720p at 15 FIPS, uh, 720p at 7.5 FIPS, all the way down to 180p at uh, 7.5 FIPS. Last then, so this is different from simulcast, um, what, what last then is, is the bridge does not decode audio, so it cannot perform dominant speaker identification based on that. But Chrome supports RFC 6464, which is an RTP header extension with audio level information, and our bridge can perform dominant speaker identification based on that. This allows it to keep an ordered list of active speakers and with last in configured, for example, say to 2, n equals to 2, the bridge sends the last two active speakers towards a specific endpoint. So again, we have, um, this is a conferencing feature that conserves uh, bandwidth. I mentioned that earlier congestion control, and in order to be able to provide the full picture, I'll just do a small note on congestion control. Regardless of what architecture you're choosing, whether it is an MCU or an SFU, you need a good congestion control algorithm. Congestion control is a very broad topic, and in this presentation, I'm going to limit myself in just one slide and talk about the main mechanism that is used in, in WebRTC. There are several congestion control algorithm proposals in the ITF RMCAT working group, but the most widely deployed algorithm and what we implement in our SFU is, uh, and also what's implemented in Chrome and Firefox is a Google congestion control algorithm uh, or GCC in short. The GCC is a feedback control algorithm. It's split into two parts, uh, an AIMD, an additive increase, multiplicative decrease part that reacts to loss and a part that reacts to packet delay variation. The main idea of the second part is that when the packet delay variation is positive, the network queue is filling up and thus the bitrate needs to be reduced. And when the packet delay variation is negative, the network queue is being emptied and we can ramp up the bitrate. As we can see in the slide, the receiver is sending back to the sender packet arrival times and packet loss information, which are being processed to compute the packet delay variation. And that's uh, fed back to the GCC running at the sender, which produces a bandwidth estimation and the sender changes its target bitrate to match uh, the bandwidth estimation, the estimated bandwidth. This is obviously a very simplified overview of what's actually happening. Depending on the network conditions, the sender may decide to use some bandwidth for packet protection. For example, it may decide to enable forward error protection or spend some bytes on packet ret retransmission over the RTX stream. So, here is the updated picture when congestion control is taken into account. We can see uh, all the previous components. We have simulcast, uh, SVC, uh, which is temporal scalability or spatial scalability, and last 10. But now we also have bandwidth estimations that are performed in the bridge. We have um, implemented in the bridge, we have an iterative improvement algorithm that orche orchestrates all these techniques. techniques. And it takes as an input the active speaker list, the viewport layout at the receiver, the bandwidth estimation that is produced by our, our GCC implementation, and it computes uh, an optimal streaming configuration in terms of user experience. So in this specific example, uh, you have the, the receiver is receiving 720p at 30 FIPS, uh, 180p at 7.5 FIPS, and no, uh, the third participant is not being... Uh, is not being received by the receiver. We have prepared a demonstration video that shows how adaptivity works in practice, um, how the bridge adjusts the simulcast layers and last 10 in order to adapt to the available bandwidth. You can, you can see that in the address uh, that's listed in this slide.
all this is great, but as we've seen in yesterday's presentation, 77.8% of the conferencing time is spent, is spent in one-on-one -on -one calls, and everything that I described so far is not necessary for one-on-one -on -one calls. In fact, as we've seen yesterday, it can both increase infrastructure costs and hurt user experience unless we are in a group call. So, in Jitsi Meet, we have implemented dynamic switching between one-on-one -on -one and group calls, where we strive to connect one-on-one -on -one participants in peer-to-peer -peer mode and fall back into group mode when there are more than two participants in a call. We have performed a measurement study that was presented yesterday and that shows the benefits of doing that. And we found that uh, we have reduced by 52% the combined data transfer towards and from our infrastructure. We have reduced by 35 to 40% the infrastructure pressure. So now we're using between 35 and 40% less CPU and memory and system load. Um, and at the same time, we have improved the user experience. Notably, the RTT has been reduced by 20 to 30%. Again, the demo time, we have prepared a video that demonstrates, demonstrates how peer-to-peer -peer for one-to-one -one works. Uh, if you're interested in, in watching that, please go to the um, URL that you can see in this slide. This is the final and complete picture of what we have today. We've recently implemented off-stage sender stream suspension. What this basically does is it pauses or reduces the bitrate of a participant that is off-stage. In other words, of a participant that is in thumbnail in every other participant in a call. We know that Google Hangouts is doing that. That's where we first noticed it and got inspired to do the same. Uh, this last part actually is quite new. We don't have any data to share yet, but imagine that in a ten, 10-way ten conference call where a client is sending 3.2 megabits per second and is receiving about the same amount, and assuming that the encoding and decoding process have about the same cost, suspending the higher quality streams and thus dropping the egress bitrate down to 150 kilobits per second can effectively have the CPU pressure on the client machine. So we have plenty more planned for the future. We would like to experiment with hardware accelerated H.264 simulcast instead of the software encoded VP8 simulcast for, for better endpoint performance to make the experience even more fluid for the video conferencing experience even more fluid for, for participants. We would like to experiment with VP9 SVC to prevent wasting bits for encoding uh, and sending multiple streams. Uh, we, we would like to have more granular sender stream suspension, but this has to wait the standardization uh, progress. We, we need to have more control over which layers and how we activate layers uh, from the client. Also, we would like to optimize data transfer when we use cascaded bridges. And we also have planned multiple congestion control improvements. We would like to have, we plan to have more aggressive bandwidth probing, faster ramp up times, and uh, also play with WebRTC adapted BBR. So that's that's all. Thank you very much for being here and I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer questions now.